last time we were talking about temperature and uh, how you increase things, objects or materials temperature by adding energy to those objects. And eventually we started talking about heat as the name we give to energy flowing into or out of an object or a substance, material, that sort of thing. And also we talked a little bit about uh, thermal expansion and contraction. Things tend to expand when they're he heated up or contract when they're cooled down. So this week's lecture is specifically on heat transfer because we didn't really talk about how you heat objects up or how that heat gets transferred. There we go. If you recall, heat transfer or heat is just the name for a flow of energy. And as I mentioned last time, heat naturally flows from higher temperature objects to lower temperature objects. And the heat flow will stop when thermal equilibrium is reached or when both the objects or the materials are at the same temperature. Uh, yep, yeah. and there's a lot of different ways. Not a lot. There's a few different ways heat can flow, types of heat flow. We're going to talk about those. But just some sort of easy or intuitive examples going on in this picture here. A little uh, girl, she has some ice cream, uh, and they're outside in the air. Right? So the ice cream's at 32 degrees, it's frozen, and the girl is at a, her internal temperature at least, around 98, uh, and the air temperature is maybe 75. So heat's flowing from uh, all these objects to the other objects. Since the ice cream is the coldest object, heat is naturally going to flow from both the air and the child, like her hand or her tongue when she starts eating the ice cream, uh, into the ice cream. That's naturally flowing from the hotter objects and the colder objects. But also, as you see, since the girl, uh, her temperature is warmer than the outside temperature, and the air temperature, heat's also flowing from her into the air. All right, so the different kinds of heat transfer, the different ways heat transfers between objects. There's basically three different kinds of heat transfer, three different ways heat will transfer. The first is known as conduction, and then convection and radiation. And we're going to go through all three of these um, in more detail, but just quickly, as you can see with this uh, diagram, radiation, the last one, is basically, uh, we're talking about electromagnetic waves, ra electromagnetic radiation that carries energy with it in order to heat up objects, transfer heat between objects. Convection uh, is essentially what's going on inside of the pot where the water there's convection currents, so there's water that's hotter at the bottom that's being brought up to the top and circulating and heat everything up, or transfer heat from the bottom water up to the top water. And then finally there's conduction, where the heat from the, uh, well, from the burner has gone up through the water in the pan, and the pan heats up, and the handle uh, is now hot, and if you were to touch that handle, you would conduct heat directly from the handle into your hand. You could also talk about conduction as if you were to stick your hand into the pot and touch the water, you would conduct heat also directly from the water to your hand. Not a great idea in either case. Okay, so let's start off with conduction. Conduction is essentially heat flow by direct contact. So you have one substance, one material, and it comes into contact with another material. So uh, example would be like your feet touching, uh, say, a tile floor or a wood floor. So the thing about conduction is that materials will conduct heat more or less easily depending on the type of material. So we would call materials that conduct heat very well conductors. So conductors conduct heat, nicely named. Materials that do not conduct heat very well are poor conductors. We call insulators. So these are their in, the insulate things. Um, and in this example, uh, your feet on these two different kinds of floors, you get an intuitive sense of how well uh, wood insulates and how well tile conducts heat. So if you were to step on a tile floor and a wood floor at the same time, it feels like the tile floor is cooler and the wood floor is warmer, even though those two materials are at the same temperature, they're at the room temperature. So maybe that room temperature is 75, your body temperature is 98, so heat's naturally gonna flow 
from your body into each of these materials, but since tile is a very good conductor, the heat will more easily flow into the tile. So essentially that feeling of it being cooler is just the fact that heat is more quickly leaving you, or leaving that foot that's touching the tile. Versus the wood, which is an insulator, so the heat is not going to leave your body as quickly. All right, so some examples for, um, I guess, specific number values we can put on uh, how conductive or insulating uh, materials are. We essentially use this value called thermal conductivity. And like most of the other values, don't worry so much about units of this value or units of this thing. Uh, more just we can relate how conductive different materials are. So, for instance, on that list, diamond turns out has a very high thermal conductivity. Okay? Meaning diamond is going to conduct heat very, very easily. So if you had a diamond floor, some incredibly rich for some reason, it would feel very cool, cooler than the tiling, right? Because the heat is going to flow even more easily than that diamond. And also up high on that list are uh, a lot of metals, uh, right? Silver, copper, brass, lead, steel, those metals are generally very good uh, thermal conductors. And then we start to get into the area where you're sort of below one for thermal conductivity, and we're starting to transfer to more insulators. It's not a clear, actually, line between conductors and insulators, but basically if you have a very high thermal conductivity, we call that a conductor, versus very low thermal conductivity, it's an insulator. So things like body fat, the wood, as we pointed out before, uh, wool, air, air has a very low thermal conductivity, meaning it's a very poor conductor or a very good insulator. It does not allow heat to flow very easily. And styrofoam uh, is even better. So as a demonstration of conductivity of materials, well, what you can do, maybe you can do, um, well, I have a video of it at least, is if you take a dollar bill um, and wrap it around the copper pipe, so you want to wrap that dollar bill very tightly around the copper pipe and place the dollar bill, that dollar bill where it is around the copper pipe, over a candle. You can hold it directly over a candle for several seconds and you're going to find out that the dollar bill doesn't burn. So why is that? Well, as we pointed out on the last slide, copper has a very high thermal conductivity. So when it's in good contact with the dollar bill, whatever heat's going into the dollar bill is quickly dispersed into the copper. So that heat really easily transfers into the copper and disperses all the way along the copper pipe. And so essentially what's happening is you're heating up the dollar bill, but that heat is very quickly just going into the copper. All right, so we're gonna try out an example of this. All right, so there we go. You got the guy with the copper pipe. He's wrapping next to a five dollar bill. And he's gonna hold it. Get a nice contact between the bill and the pipe. He's gonna take it and he's gonna hold it right over that flame. Two. Cut a few seconds. Yeah. And he takes it away and he shows you. Well, it's blackened on one side, but it didn't actually burn, right? That blackening is just the soot from the candle flame. So interesting uh, properties of very good thermal conductors. You can use things, uh, something like that. Uh, okay, so how about uh, things about insulators, right? So things that don't conduct uh, or do not conduct heat very well, we call it insulators. So air, as I pointed out before, is a very good insulator. Um, and how you can see that in practice, well, you have pizza ovens, right? It's extremely hot inside the pizza oven, 500 degrees, 600 degrees, but a lot of them don't even have doors. The reason being is that the air in, this, in that area is a very good insulator, meaning heat doesn't travel through it or disperse through it very well. So even though it might be warm right at that opening, and it might be warm kind of close to it, it actually is not very warm if you're maybe a foot or two away, right? Because the air is very good at insulating that heat and keeping it from spreading around. Um, another example would be um, if you stick your hand into a hot oven, same sort of thing. The air isn't going to conduct the heat into your hand very well. And so you stick your hand into a hot oven, even though the air in that oven 
is 300 degrees, 350 degrees, whatever it is, you're not going to get burned, or at least not if you don't leave it in for too long, right? Eventually the heat is going to be able to conduct, and it just takes a little while. And this is also why, you know, when you're going to pull a pan out of the oven, those pans are generally made out of metal, and that metal conducts heat very quickly, very easily. It's a good thermal conductor. Uh, so you want to use something like uh, some oven mitts uh, in order to grab that metal. And the reason we use the oven mitts, or even just a towel or cloth, uh, is because those are made of hot cotton or wool or something like that, and they're very good insulators. I mean, you grab it, one side of it, maybe it's getting uh, warmed or getting heated up pretty quickly from the metal, but that heat doesn't travel through that material, so your hand on the other side of it is going to be okay. So, the second kind of heat transfer is what we call convection. So we have conduction, where you actually touch something directly, put things together, um, or things in direct contact. Um, and then we have convection, where is essentially this is the way, or a way that heat transfers in fluids. Remember, gases, liquids, and actually plasmas too, but we're not going to worry about plasmas for the most part. So gases and liquids both act as fluids, meaning they can easily move around. They can change kind of their orientation or flow in different ways. So essentially convection, you could say it's, this is bulk movement of fluids. So like in this picture, we have a little like uh, heater that you might have in your house. And what that heater is doing is heating up cool air that's near the bottom or near the floor usually in your house. And as it heats it up, that air uh, is going to expand. It's going to get less dense. It's going to rise. Right? So that warm air is getting is rising up and mixing sort of in a way with all the air that's already up there. So one way to think about convection is just essentially it's parts of fluids are warmed and then moved into cooler parts, and that heat sort of mixes up, mixes up a little bit. So two other uh, sort of related examples actually of convection would be like um, a hot tub. So a hot tub, there's not like a burner that the hot tub's sitting on in order to get hot. There's no flame that's below it, usually at least. Uh, what will happen in a hot tub is there's uh, some sort of uh, heating element that heats up water not in that hot tub and then pumps that hot water into the hot tub. So that hot water now the bulk amount of this fluid, this hotter water, comes in, mixes up with the other fluid that's already there, the water that's there, and overall all of it sort of heats up. So this is an example of convection. And right, our other example back from the beginning was if you have this uh, pot sitting on the stove, right, the pan's being heated up directly by the burner, and then the bottom of the pan is getting hot, and that is in contact directly with the water that's at the bottom of the pan, so there's conduction going on between the pan and that water. But after that water heats up, it expands, it gets less dense, so it starts to move. Right? It starts to, uh, since it's less dense, it becomes buoyant and starts to move up in the, uh, the water that's around it. And so essentially you have that heated water from the bottom getting pushed up and mixing around with the other water, it cools back down, it comes back down, and then heat up again, and we have this convective, uh, what we call it convective flow. So we think convection, and just think of big movements of fluid, more fluid moving into cooler fluid. So one more, I guess, example to remember that you know fluid doesn't necessarily just mean liquid, right? Gases are fluids too. So um, if you've ever used or have a convection oven, convection ovens work uh, by convection, and what that means in terms of your oven is instead of your oven. A regular oven just has a heating element, either it's a flame or it's a piece of metal that's heated up, and that heat just slowly starts to, starts to kind of equilibrate the whole oven to the same temperature. With a convection oven, you actually have a fan in there, and that fan uh, will be uh, set up so that it pushes the hot air, the air that's being heated by the heating element, all the way around that uh, oven, all the way around the space. So instead of just warm, this heating element slowly warming air and that air slowly, kind of that heat slowly dispersing through the entire oven, you have this fan so that that air that's being warmed up right at the top 
that uh, fan will start pushing that air around. So it turns out that uh, candles transfer most of their heat through convection, and that's particularly, or specifically, in convection of heat that uh, happens when the candle heats the air that's above it, directly above it, and that air will rise up. So that air right above it rises up, but it heats up, it expands, it rises up, transferring heat through convection by moving up to uh, cooler air. And as that air moves, then more air comes in to replace it, that air gets heated up, it rises up as well, and so you get the sort of convective flow again. So this is also why, well, as long as it's not windy, or you're inside somewhere where it's still, you put your hand pretty close around the outside of the candle flame, and it's not actually very hot, because the only kind of heat you're getting when you put your hand in that region is actually radiative heat, radiation, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but yeah, versus if you put your hand directly above the candle, it's going to get hot very quickly, right? Because that's where most of the heat in the candle is going. And you can sort of see those convective currents, right? If you have a candle and you shine a bright light on it, you can see the convective currents so in the shadow of that candle flow of uh, that heat air rising up. So an interesting uh, demonstration of this, uh, the fact that most of that heat is going upwards, right? through heating up the air, that air rises, more air comes in to fill that gap, and then that air will get heated up and it will rise as well. However, if you have a candle that's uh, you know in a container, you can actually put that candle out by just dropping the container. And the reason being is that when the candle and the container are stationary, the air, once that hot air rises up, the candle needs more air in order to keep going, right? It's burning that uh, combined, well, part of the burning is it needs oxygen, right? So that oxygen needs to flow back in order to keep the candle going. But the reason that that air gets pushed in is because of the atmosphere, the weight of the atmosphere is pushing down all the air above it. So it's pushing the uh, air into that cup that goes down to the bottom and uh, meets up with the flame and continues that flame, or to allow that flame to burn. However, if you drop that cup, remember when something is in free fall, let it go, then it's in a state of weightlessness, right? So the air inside of that cup isn't feeling any weight. And the only reason that the air would be pushed down is because of the weight of the air. So essentially you drop it, there's no more weight to uh, force that weight pushing the air down to continue going. There's no more air that's going to continue going to the candle flame, the candle flame is going to go out. So they're doing an example where you have a candle burning, in, not just in an open cup, but in a closed container. Right? And eventually that candle is going to go out as well because it depletes all the oxygen. It uses up all the oxygen. So there's no more oxygen to burn anymore. And eventually, once it's used all up, it goes out. However, you do that same thing, except now you drop that cup. Right? And again, now the air is no longer going to push down to actually Add, keep adding more fuel to that flame, the flame's going to go out pretty much instantly. Okay, so the final point to make about uh, convection, okay, how we transfer heat through convection, is well, essentially why we use things like fiberglass in order to insulate our houses. Okay? So the whole point of having insulation uh, the walls and the ceiling is in order to keep the heat in the house, right? During the winter time when it's cold outside, you have a heater generally or fireplace or something, it's heating up the air in the house, but you don't want that heat to transfer um, outside the house very easily, right? Uh, and on the opposite end, in the summer when it's very hot outside, right? maybe you have an air conditioner, so you're cooling the air down inside your house, but you don't want the heat from the outside to steal to easily transfer in and warm the air back up. So the whole point of insulation is to use an insulator in the walls and the ceiling and the floors sometimes that um, does not easily conduct or transfer the heat either from the inside of your house to the outside or from the outside of the house to the inside. So going back to the idea or the fact that air is a 
a poor thermal conductor, meaning it's a good insulator. It doesn't, it does not transfer heat easily. Fiberglass is the most of the volume that makes up fiberglass is air. Right? There's these other almost like string-like glass particles um, that make up the for the structure of the fiberglass. But the whole point of them is that they have a lot of space in between them where they can have just still air sitting there. So. Since the air is a good insulator, when you have heat on either side of the uh, fiberglass, it doesn't easily convect or conduct uh, uh, through the insulation. You sort of put something, this insulation, that holds a lot of uh, air in order to stop uh, heat transfer. All right, and so the final way that heat will transfer, as I mentioned, is what we call radiation and radiation specifically of the light kind. So if you're thinking of nuclear radiation or uh, other ways you may have heard of radiation, light, electromagnetic radiation is a big part of overall radiation. There are other types of radiation, but we're not worried about those right now. Right? We're just talking about electromagnetic radiation or light. So if you didn't know, light, like I mentioned, it's an electromagnetic wave. And again, we haven't talked about electro electromagnetism electricity magnetism yet. We'll do that later. Um, so we're going to kind of give you get a little sneak preview about light for now because it is important in heat transfer. So um, light uh, essentially comes in a whole spectrum of wavelengths, meaning that if we have like this picture down here, you could sort of think about light as just these little uh, waves. So like for the radio waves, you have this very long sort of wavelength, and the wavelength just measures essentially the, like how spread out it is. So when the wave goes uh, up and then back down and starts to go up again, and go through a whole wavelength. So the radial waves, the wavelength is very long. Infrared, like infrared radiation you get from fire or from this heating lamp, is much shorter than that. Visible light, or the light waves like we have from uh, lamps, fluorescent lights, incandescent lights, even shorter, and it turns out Ultraviolet waves are even shorter than that. Beyond that, you get into uh, X rays, gamma rays, and just shorter and shorter and shorter frequencies. Or sorry, shorter and shorter wavelengths. As it turns out, all light carries energy and it can thus transfer heat. So, something you've probably been familiar with before, seen before, are heat lamps, right? And literally, they're giving off heat. You can feel that heat actually, right? And that's radiative heat. So, this is heat transferred through uh, that middle example there, infrared waves. So infrared are just a bit longer than the normal visible light waves. Something to know about light and I guess waves in general, it's going to be helpful for understanding heat transfer through radiation, is that when you're talking about a wave like light, there are two sort of main ways to classify that wave. And that is its wavelength, which I already mentioned before, and its frequency. And they're essentially two sides or two inverse ways of classifying a wave. So we're talking essentially about the same sort of thing, but in, in coming at it from different different sides. So one way to understand how wavelength and frequency are related, we sort of like these pictures here, where if you take a string and you attach it to a wall. Or you see like people at the gym have those do the rope swing thing, do the rope things like that. Right? But essentially, what they're doing is they're uh, oscillating the end, one end of the string, and the faster they oscillate it, right, that's a higher frequency that you're going through. So more oscillations per second. So you go faster and faster oscillations, you get shorter and shorter wavelengths. Versus if you go very uh, low frequency, very long, sort of longer time in between oscillations, you get longer wavelengths. So high frequency is essentially the same as saying short wavelength, and low frequency is the same as saying uh, long wavelengths. And again, wave, wavelength will vary from very, very short to very, very long, and frequency would say varies from very, very high frequency to very, very low frequency frequency being the amount of time something oscillates per second. Right, so just going back quickly then, 
for the radio waves, a very long wavelength, very low frequency waves. Infrared, maybe sort of in the middle, a bit higher frequency or mid, uh, mid wavelength. Uh, so mid sort of frequency maybe. And then light waves are again even over to x-rays, very short wavelengths, very high frequencies. And it turns out it's a little bit easier to talk about the energy that uh, light will carry in terms of its frequency. So essentially the higher the frequency of light, the more energy that light is carrying. So the wavelength, the radio waves are carrying energy but not a, very, not a lot. Infrared carrying more energy, light waves carrying more energy. Over again into X rays, gamma rays, more and more and more energy. So uh, it turns out that all objects radiate. And essentially, the higher the temperature of the object, the higher the frequency of the light that they radiate, meaning the higher energy of light that's being uh, radiated. Say people just sitting around a room, right? They're radiating energy. I'm radiating energy right now, the walls are radiating energy, the floor, the camera, everything's radiating energy. But um, at temperatures like normal room temperatures, that energy is too low frequency to see with our eye. However, if you use special cameras like thermal cameras, right, we're radiating actually infrared radiation. And so you have infrared cameras that actually see in those wavelengths. Right? It's like eyes, but they see in uh, longer wavelengths, a bit longer than normal visible light, that infrared light. So this picture up here, right, this is a picture from an infrared camera, and the color spectrum indicates the temperature. The surrounding room is about 75 degrees, so that's sort of the low end of the spectrum, the very dark areas are around 70, versus higher temperature areas like people, right, Our bodies are generally about 90 degrees, so people are radiating at a higher temperature, right? shorter uh, wavelengths, higher frequencies. Um, once you get to you know, some pretty high temperatures, then objects will actually radiate the, the again, they're always radiating light, but you'll actually be able to uh, see that light that's being radiated. And that happens essentially when you heat up something to the point that it's glowing. So like this, this iron, uh, piece of iron, one of them's heated up enough so that it's glowing, you'd say white hot. So you're actually, in effect, you're sort of seeing that uh, heat radiation. Um, yeah, so there's sort of an interesting property of light radiation or heat radiation is that since it's light, it interacts with different objects, colored objects, in different ways. Right? So you might already know intuitively or seen that white objects will reflect a lot of light versus black objects which absorb light or don't really reflect light. You can see this if you just have like a white piece of paper versus a black piece of paper and you're outside in a bright day, the white piece of paper is only blinding versus the black piece of paper is not because the white is uh, reflecting a lot of that sunlight. However, even if you have totally white objects but their geometry is such that when light goes inside of the object, there's a lot of ways for that light to sort of bounce around in there. You get places where white objects will seem black because the light bounces all around everywhere and not much of it actually comes back out, it's reflected back out. Even though it is being reflected by the white surfaces, it's just the geometry is such that a lot of that light doesn't come back out. It's like looking at these like white tubes and PVC tubes. So light is you can see on the outside, right, the tubes are white, light is brown, bouncing back out, obviously they're very white, but when the light enters inside, it starts to bounce around inside, and most of it doesn't really come back out, so it starts to look black. Similarly, if you have just like a box, and you have the box is white outside and inside, you put a little hole in the box, right, anytime you look in that box, it's going to look black, not because it's painted black, but because the light entering it bounces around, and not much of it actually comes back in. All right, that's all the ways that uh, heat transfers. Conduction, convection, radiation, and kind of put all those together in thinking about why a thermos, a good thermos, is built the way that it is. In most thermoses, right, they sort of have this similar construction 
where you have usually a, a double wall container and the space inside of that wall is a vacuum or at least uh, most of the air is pumped out of there so there's a little bit of air but not much and then also on the inside and sometimes the outside as well this uh, surfaces are silvered or essentially like mirrors and of course you have a uh, top stopper or a lid of some kind so each of these things is sort of uh, working to stop heat transfer, the different kinds of heat transfer. So the walls, um, or there being essentially a vacuum in between uh, the walls of this uh, thermos, means that, well, if we think about air as being a very poor conductor or a good insulator, if you have no air or very little air, that's even a better insulator essentially. And it turns out that a vacuum, if there was actually no air, like, you know, out in space, it doesn't conduct, conduct heat at all. Essentially because there's no atoms or molecules there to, to transfer that heat in any way. So the vacuum, or the very low amount of air in that uh, double wall area, protects against heat conduction. The silvered surfaces, or the mirrored surfaces, uh, will protect against radiation, since you know, the material inside, uh, maybe it's coffee or something like that, it's radiating energy, but again, that energy is light, and light will essentially reflect off of these surfaces, even that, even infrared light. So most of the, that radiation is not able to escape, it gets bounced right back into the uh, coffee, or whatever it may be. And finally, the one that's a little bit, I don't know, almost too easy, is, you know, you always put a top on it, so that you don't have maybe other liquid coming in, spilling in. That's you know, if you have hot coffee in there, you don't want cold water to somehow spill in there, because that way you would get uh, a convection. Right? If you have other fluid, or even the same fluid, but just at a colder temperature, that somehow got in, right? That fluid would move through, would mix in with the fluid that's already there, and bring the overall temperature down. So you can sort of see all three uh, types of heat transfer being blocked or controlled in a way by uh, Douglas. Alright, so back to just uh, radiation. You know, if you've ever seen uh, a greenhouse, right? a greenhouse is generally a place where you have sort of like a garden, but it's inside of a uh, glass or usually a glass uh, building of some sort. So the reason that greenhouses are built that way is because they actually generally want to raise the temperature um, that the plants are in, or the plants are going to be growing in. So the, the way that you actually, the greenhouses raise the temperature inside of them is that when light from the sun uh, comes and hits the greenhouse, the light from the sun is visible light. Uh, there's also ultraviolet, but a pretty short wavelength overall. And glass, it turns out, is actually pretty transparent to short wavelengths. And that just means that short wavelengths will pass pretty easily through glass. So the sun's electromagnetic radiation, that heat radiation of the sun, easily passes in. And once it's in, that radiation will either hit the uh, plants, it'll hit the ground, even just the air that's inside of the greenhouse. So it essentially warms up, uh, transfers heat to all those objects, and again, those objects are radiating heat themselves, but they're all radiating heat at much longer wavelengths than the wavelengths that are coming in from the sun. So the longer wavelengths that are re-radiated by these objects are much less likely to pass out of the glass. Right? The reason being that glass is what we would say it is opaque to those longer wavelengths, particularly with the infrared radiation. So short wavelengths come in, get absorbed, get re-radiated as longer wavelengths and can't get back out. So all that radiated heat is sort of trapped inside the greenhouse. So this doesn't just happen in greenhouses, this happens on a global scale, um, as what we call, or what is called Earth's uh, sort of greenhouse effect. So partly the reason that life can exist here um, is because we have an atmosphere that 
uh, will trap some of the heat from the sun. So the heat from the sun is again these short wavelengths that they come in, and the, those radiation or that heat radiation comes in at short wavelengths, passes generally down into the atmosphere, and once it gets down into a more dense area of the atmosphere, where there's a lot more air. It starts maybe heating up that air more quickly, and then um, if it goes all the way to the ground, it heats up the ground. So those short wavelengths are absorbed by the air, by the ground, and just like in you know a regular greenhouse, the air and the ground then re-radiate that energy back out, but again at longer wavelengths and in infrared wavelengths. So it turns out that the atmosphere has stuff in it, um, like water vapor, carbon dioxide. Uh, methane, things that are opaque to long wavelength radiation. So when that radiation from the Earth's surface and the people and the air and all the objects, when it gets re-radiated to long wavelengths, a lot of that uh, long wavelength radiation, that infrared radiation, doesn't actually just leave the atmosphere again. It gets kind of knocked back down to the surface. So the effect is that heat is essentially trapped around the Earth by the atmosphere which is a good thing, in a way, because if not, the Earth would be very, very cold, and it'd be hard to have life here. However, well, it's not always a good thing. All right, so, let me try this out. This is a question to ask yourself. Uh, what does it mean that the greenhouse effect, either in the regular glass greenhouse or the Earth, is like a one-way valve? And also, can this energy build up forever? inside the greenhouse or earth. I'll let you take something think about that. Hopefully just pause it, think about it. Maybe write something down. Yeah. Okay. Well, what does it mean to say that the greenhouse effect is like a one-way valve? So going back to the explanation just a minute ago, short wavelength radiation from the sun and specifically talking about the Earth's greenhouse effect, that short wavelength radiation will enter the atmosphere and will warm the atmosphere, will warm the surface of the Earth, and that atmosphere and the surface will re-radiate re the energy at longer wavelengths. But again, the atmosphere is now sort of opaque, more opaque to those long wavelengths because of these things like water vapor and carbon dioxide and uh, things like that in the atmosphere. So once that energy gets in, essentially not much of it gets back out, or less, a lot less of it gets back out. So that's what, why I would say it's sort of like a one-way valve. And an uh, interesting question is, can this build up for, can this uh, build up energy forever? And yeah, I mean, basically, yes. And this is something that's actually known as the runaway greenhouse effect in terms of planets and Earth. If you have enough gases in the atmosphere that make up the atmosphere that are greenhouse gases, so they are opaque to those infrared waves, when enough of them are atmosphere, the atmosphere essentially becomes completely opaque, or if you have this runaway effect, the atmosphere becomes completely opaque to those infrared waves, and so once the energy comes in, it never gets back out. And you just keep adding, the sun is just continually adding more and more energy to the Earth, the atmosphere to the surface, so it just keeps warming up more and more and more. So some things that might happen, you know, if that does happen, well, the Earth's surface temperature will continue to rise, not a great thing. Ocean levels uh, will rise as well, and, well, the ocean temperature will rise, and remember, when objects are heated, or their temperature is increased, they generally expand. Water is no, not an exception to that. So, since the oceans are going to be heated up, they'll expand, the sea levels will rise, and eventually, I mean, if this effect keeps going on, if you continue to build that energy up, then the surface temperature will be enough that you'll just be able to boil the oceans, it'll be hot enough to boil the oceans. So, it's thought that Venus actually had an atmosphere at some point, possibly oceans, but it might have experienced uh, this sort of runaway greenhouse effect for one reason or another. And you look at Venus now, it's not a nice place to be. So, some things that we might be thinking about then. For one, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Again, because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, 
And just to point some stuff out, that using uh, ice core samples, scientists have been able to measure essentially the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over a very long period. And in that period, there's you know, a, a lot of variation overall, or a fair amount of variation, right? You see these sort of natural sort of ups and downs. Turns out those cycles, at least in the last 800,000 years, really only vary between about 170 parts per million and 300 parts per million. If you haven't heard the term parts per million before, it's just a measure of how much of something makes up a gas, usually a gas. Uh, 170 parts per million would mean that in some volume of gas, if there's a million particles in that gas, then 170 of them are carbon dioxide. So the sort of natural cycle seems to be in this 170 to 300 parts per million range. Turns out we're somewhere around 400 parts per million at this point. Right? So through, since the Industrial Revolution began, we've sort of been burning a lot of uh, carbon and in order to power all kinds of things, to create energy, to drive the cars, things like that. So yeah, so we've essentially just been dumping carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we've put quite a lot in. And what seems to be a result of that is, as you would expect, if you make the greenhouse more and more opaque to infrared radiation, then more and more of that infrared radiation, infrared radiation stays inside the greenhouse and continues to heat it up. So the Earth, being our sort of greenhouse, and the atmosphere being sort of the glass around it, by adding more and more uh, CO2 into that atmosphere, it seems like we're making it more and more opaque to that thermal radiation, so more of that radiation staying uh, right around the Earth and heating the Earth's surface up. Um, this is just a chart from the last um, 130 years or so, and just sort of showing that pretty much since the Industrial Revolution, uh, surface temperatures have, for the most part, been going up. There's actually a period where they kind of stabilized and went down a little bit, but we've even taken a much more dramatic sort of upturn in the last few uh, decades. Right. So, that's the basis of something called global warming, in that we are essentially making the Earth's greenhouse more and more opaque. And in doing that, we're trapping more and more heat around the Earth, and among other things, just raising the Earth's surface temperature. It's worth pointing out that the long-term effects of this um, are somewhat concerning. And finally, some partial solutions to this problem that we seem to have is essentially to minimize our reliance on energy sources that produce greenhouse gases. The easiest way we can reduce this problem is by stop pumping as much CO2 in the atmosphere. So a number of different ways of doing that, more than are shown here, and this is just examples of other energy sources. Uh, so for instance, photovoltaics. Photovoltaics, essentially that, that short wave width uh, radiation from the sun, when it hits a photovoltaic cell, can actually be transferred transformed directly into electrical energy. So these panels, uh, solar panels, are able to just transform that uh, sunlight directly into electrical energy, which is pretty nice. Wind turbines, obviously, another uh, example where the power from the wind moving around is transferred into energy by, well, turning these big windmills, wind turbines, um, and those wind turn turbines turn electrical uh, circuits, which you know, we'll talk about later, but essentially if you can turn something, you can generate electrical, uh, ele electricity. And another form of solar energy is these concentrated solar uh, power farms, where it's not something that's uh, taking that solar energy and convert, being able to convert it directly to electrical energy, but um, you set up these huge, essentially mirrors, to concentrate all of the solar energy. So the solar energy hits this whole area and all of that, uh, the mirrors uh, reflect that solar energy and focus it back to a point, that point being the top of that, the tower in this image, which uh, heats up incredibly hot and that heat energy can be transferred into essentially water. So that you boil the water, you create steam and that steam turns a turbine. And again, once you can turn something, you can basically make electricity. 
and uh, that's it.